Welcome back, my dear friends, to Dr. Creepin's Vault, where I read two stories that have been sent to me by you, my dear lovelies. <laughs> no, but seriously, thank you very much for sending these two stories. Always on the lookout for more great tales to tell, so look in the description for the link if you've got a story you want me to read. Now, two intriguing tales of terror for you this evening. Both quite different in their own ways, but both pretty damn creepy. Well, my dear friends, it's Friday evening, and you know what time it is. It's time to sit back with your favorite drink, and listen. Those who knew Patricia considered her to be somewhat difficult. Hell, they thought she was a bitch. A loud-mouthed, cantankerous, overbearing she-devil who spat out obscenities and insults like some fire-breathing dragon. For more than 30 years, she accomplished the alienation of almost every person she came into contact with. Neighbours, co-workers, Acquaintances, even family members, were subjected to her rants and vicious taunts. Married to an extremely patient, if not spineless man, Patricia's husband passed away a few days before their 25th anniversary. Some joke that after years of being a doormat, he finally grew a backbone and killed himself just to spite her. She had three daughters who, miraculously, grew into good-natured, kind-hearted young women, despite being raised by that bellowing troublemaker. One by one, each girl discovered a way to escape their mother's home, and once they left, they seldom returned to visit. I say she had three children, but, in actuality, she had another child, a daughter from her first marriage. No one, including Patricia, ever spoke about the girl, or even acknowledged her existence. She was like a forbidden joke you weren't supposed to say out loud, or a monstrous urban legend like Bloody Mary or Candyman, whose name you never let slip from your lips for fear of death. Supposedly, when she was barely 14 years old, she ran away never to be heard from again. There were no questions, no accusations. Nothing. She was just gone. With the death of her husband and the absence of her girls, Patricia, feeling somewhat isolated and alone, which many felt was of her own doing, began taking in rumours for extra income. Why anyone would willingly live under that woman's roof was beyond comprehension but most of her renters consisted of students or transients who were low on cash and in desperate need of a cheap place to stay. One of her residents was a quiet and unassuming man named Brandon. No one knew much about his background or prior whereabouts. He just appeared on Patricia's doorstep one day, inquiring about a room to rent. To everyone's surprise, he and the dragon lady became almost inseparable. Brandon wasn't intimidated or easily insulted by her off-handed and sometimes hostile comments, which caused many, including several tenants, to retreat. As the months progressed and the other rumours began to vacate, Patricia began to rely heavily on Brandon. Frequently he was spotted running an array of errands for her, whether it was picking up a prescription or gathering groceries for her at the local markets. He became indispensable to her, a true confidant. One particular evening, as they prepared for dinner, Patricia, feeling uncharacteristically gracious, thanked Brandon for all he had done for her. <laughs> it's nothing, he nonchalantly replied. Oh, yes it is. Patricia retorted adamantly. My own flesh and blood don't even come around to see what I'm doing. 
you're the only one who seems to give a damn. <laughs> That's not true, Patricia. The hell it ain't. Those ungrateful little bitches of mine couldn't care less if I was alive or dead. Brandon didn't respond and let her prattle on. I, I know I ain't the easiest woman to love, but I'm no devil. I, I just wish... Her voice trailed off and Brandon was surprised to see tears welling up in her eyes. What were you going to say? He asked softly. Quickly wiping away the tears, Patricia snapped. I, I just got some regrets, that's all. Like everyone else. Brandon was intrigued. He picked up the bottle of that cheap-ass wine Patricia loved to gulp down every night and filled both of their glasses to the rim. After taking a sip and trying not to grimace, he questioned, What do you regret? Patricia was silent for a few minutes, but after guzzling down most of her wine, she heaved a long sigh and suddenly blurted out, Andrea. What? Andrea, my eldest daughter. I don't talk about her much. Brandon said nothing. I couldn't stand her father. Lazy, no good son of a bitch. We were married for five years, and each day I hated him more and more. He took off a year after Andrea was born. She went on to talk about her resentment of being straddled down with a child she never really wanted, and how she took out her frustrations on her daughter. Don't get me wrong, I love my baby girl. I just didn't like her at times. I realize now I wasn't ready to be a mother. What did she do to make you dislike her? A lot of things. She was a strange child. Never spoke much and would always stare at you like she knew some deep, dark secrets, but wouldn't tell. She poured herself another glass of wine and continued. Maybe because she was a spitting image of her daddy, I... <laughs> Again, her voice faltered. You what? I wanted to change her, make her more like me. She was always such a tomboy, it drove me crazy. Even as a little girl, she never wanted to wear those pretty dresses I bought for her. Those damn things weren't cheap. She'd rather run around in a t-shirt and jeans. She never seemed to appreciate how much I worked to give her nice things. Patricia's voice began to slightly rise with a hint of bitterness. Brandon was enthralled and eagerly waited for her to resume telling the story. I, I guess I was hard on her more so than my other girls. But it was just me and her. I had no support. That sorry ex-husband of mine wasn't helping her at all. So everything fell on me and I was tired. Besides, Sometimes you have to beat respect into a child. Hmm. So, you were abusive towards Andrea. No. I mean, maybe. I just wanted her to listen and mind what I said. Another sip of the wine. She was so goddamn stubborn. She would fight me tooth and nail whenever I tried to dress her up like a little lady. She was so pretty in her dresses, and I would always love to brush her beautiful hair. <sighs> she was my little angel. Brandon amused himself at witnessing such contradictions. An unwanted child was still considered to be a little angel by the parent who, at times, loathed her. The absurdity was almost laughable. Perhaps the twisted stories that swarmed around this woman weren't just idle gossip. Maybe she was a bit unhinged. As Patricia reminisced, if you will, about the past, she was completely oblivious to the change in Brandon's demeanor. It was as if he had been saturated in a shroud of darkness, an intense anger, which lay dormant in the pit of his stomach for years, was beginning to erupt. 
and slither its way through his entire body, causing every muscle to ignite with fury. He sat motionless and continued to listen, somewhat buzzed from almost consuming an entire bottle of wine. Patricia divulged more of her dirty little secrets. There was one time I really lost it. I'm not proud of what I did. What happened? She told the story of how she arrived home after working all day to find Andrea tearing apart her dresses and stuffing them into a large garbage bag. What are you doing? Patricia screamed at the top of her lungs. I hate wearing these, Andrea calmly replied. Seized by an uncontrollable rage, Patricia pounced on her daughter and began to repeatedly strike her in the face. The child never muttered a sound, even as her mother dragged her by the hair into the bedroom. She remained silent. This is what happens to ungrateful little girls, Patricia hissed as she grabbed a pair of scissors. In a matter of minutes, Andrea's closet was utterly bare, and her clothes were strewn about the floor, torn and tattered. In what can only be defined as a heinous act, Patricia described how she forcibly stripped Andrea down to her undergarments and made her stand outside in the cold. Brandon sucked his teeth in shock and disgust. She stood on the porch, shaking like a leaf for over an hour. Patricia's voice strained with embarrassment. But she never made a sound. No tears, no screaming, nothing. Brandon's smirk reappeared. Everything changed that night. She barely said a word to me unless I spoke to her first. It was like living with a stranger. A few months later, she ran off. Didn't you try to find her? Of course I did. I went to the police and filled out all the paperwork, but they basically blew it off as just another runaway and figured she'd come back. But she never did. Not that I wanted her to. Starting over was easier without her around. Patricia looked directly at Brandon. <sighs> You probably think I'm a horrible person. Brandon flashed her a sympathetic smile. Not at all. We've all done things in our past we're not proud of. Patricia nodded in agreement. When was the last time you saw her? Almost 25 years ago. She'd be about 39 now, maybe even 40. And I wouldn't even know who she was if I saw her. Pretty sad, don't you think? A mother not being able to recognize her own child. But what can you do? <laughs> what can you do? She chuckled. Feigning understanding and empathy, Brandon found it incomprehensible that a mother could seem so cavalier about her missing child. You've got quiet all of a sudden, Patricia observed. What's on your mind? <laughs> it's my 40th birthday, Brandon said matter-of-factly. Patricia quickly rose to her feet. What? Why didn't you say anything? Ah, it's no big deal. I stopped celebrating my birthday years ago. Why? Oh, I have my reasons. Though Patricia wanted to pry, something in his tone caused her to stop. As she returned to her seat, she accidentally knocked over the bottle of wine. Red droplets stained the front of her blouse. <sighs> Look what you did, Brandon scolded. Oh, it's fine. Nothing a cup of bleach can fix. Then, without provocation, he slapped her. Dazed and confused. Patricia caressed her cheek and yelled. What, what, what the hell was that for? She was answered with another blow, 
which knocked her out of her seat. Blood began to slowly trickle from her lip. Why? She whimpered. As Brandon towered over the terrified woman, memories of an horrific childhood bashed into his psyche like a sledgehammer. He saw images of a frightened little boy, a captive in his own home, enduring the taunts and insults of a mother who, in her sadistic and delusional state, attempted to transform him into the perfect daughter. She emotionally battered him with unflattering comparisons to his absentee father. She seemed to relish, if not take a perverse delight, in punishing him for attributes which were out of his control. The way he spoke, his facial features, his sex. Her intense hatred for his father bordered on obsession, which, in turn, annihilated her son's sanity. Brandon's eyes began to blink uncontrollably as he, again, could feel the sting of the winter chill bristling against his nearly naked body that night. He stood on the porch in below zero weather. His body quivered under the weight of recollections of being forced to parade around in ill-fitting party dresses and garish coloured hair ribbons. His toy box never consisted of action figures, building sets, BB guns or water pistols. Instead, his mother bombarded him with Barbie dolls, teddy bears, makeup kits, anything to undermine his masculinity and any attempt of reluctance or protestation resulted in a brutal beating. It's not that you didn't want a child, Patricia. You just didn't want a boy. Patricia's eyes widened with fear, as she came face to face with the sins of her past. Before she could respond, Brandon landed a ferocious kick directly to her ribs, causing her to howl out in excruciating pain. When he kicked her again, she blacked out. When Patricia finally awakened, she found herself naked and tied to a chair, which was placed in front of the vanity mirror in her bedroom. She could hear noises coming from behind her. She stared into the mirror and could see in her reflection Brandon, ripping her clothes to shreds with a long butcher knife. This is what happens when you're ungrateful, he taunted. Patricia struggled to free herself, but her attempts were futile. She was trapped securely in the chair and could not move. Beads of sweat moistened her brow as she watched Brandon walk towards her, grinning from ear to ear. As he stood next to her, still holding onto the knife, he reached for the hairbrush lying on the dressing table. Now, let's make you really pretty, he snickered. Patricia screamed. I am an artist. Well, not in the traditional sense. But I do indeed possess some kind of artistic talent. I usually get by with making commissions suggested by my limited amount of fans. Although I am grateful to have any at all, considering my subjects to paint are a little obscure. A few years ago, I became obsessed with anatomy. Learning how the body worked and its structure was more appealing than most things others find pleasurable. The one thing that appealed more to me, however, was what lies underneath all the muscle and flesh. Yes, skeletons. The configuration of bones lying beneath our skin. There was always something taboo about them. Something that seemed to stir up an unjustified fear in so many. I wouldn't paint them blandly, though. I'd add a bit of personality to each one of my masterpieces. One aspiring to be an astronaut, another a beautiful dancer, 
each one with a specific craving to be someone of worth. As much as I love giving them their own distinct personalities, I didn't know how far their desires could reach until I received a seemingly harmless request from an anonymous individual. I was just about to call it a night, having finished three commissions that day, when an email suddenly presented itself onto my computer screen, accompanied with an audible bing. I stared at the screen, then shifted my eyes to the time. It was almost 3.20 a.m. Why would someone request something so late? Despite my better judgment, I opened the email. Very little information was provided about the desired piece, or the one seeking it. The only information the email contained was a phone number and a message asking for a life-sized painting. I figured the person sent the email as a prank, and so I disregarded it. I would call the number in the morning to check if this was legit. I awoke from a beam of light penetrating through my window, descending down the sun's calescent surface. I sat up in bed and immediately powered up my laptop and logged onto my email. I was aghast to see I'd received five more emails from the anonymous sender, each one explaining, in a bit more detail, what his aspirations were for the piece. The background should be blank, just empty, a black void. The bones should be anatomically correct, realistic with shadows and accurate lighting. Its expression should show sadness or loneliness, a yearning to be alive once more. I will transfer money to your bank account for supplies. Do not contact me until it's finished, as I am a very busy man. Well, at least I now knew his gender. I quickly logged into my bank account. The money was there, as he said. I had received $50,000 from my unknown client. I eyed my screen, befuddled. How did he know my account number? And why send such a large amount of money? Taking his last comment into consideration, it would be best to accept the offer for now and refund him later. I just could not accept this much money for one piece. Beginning the piece was a bit more troublesome than I expected. For some unknown reason... I just couldn't get the measurements to line up. I decided to use my own measurements for the piece, and soon it began to take shape. Laying down the paintbrush, I stepped back, thoroughly admiring my fatiguing magnum opus. It embodied the details of the stranger's emails perfectly. I glanced at the clock. It was 7.34 p.m., Nearly the entire day was preoccupied with finishing this piece. The feeling of exhaustion began to cripple my brain. I decided to contact my mysterious client in the morning and hit the sack a little early. Throughout the night, I heard the sound of crepitation emanating from the direction of the painting. I glanced at it occasionally, but couldn't find the cause of the sound. My eyes searched around the room, slowly collapsing under sunken anchors, eventually forcing me into a deep slumber. When the morning finally arrived, I spent some time carefully inspecting the room, especially the painting. It didn't take long to discover the source of the unpleasant late-night crackling. Collected below the painting was chips of dried paint littered across the floor. Looking closely at the painting, I could see that the skeleton's thin mouth was turned upright. Oh, how could that be? I could have sworn I painted it with a scowl. The reasoning behind it eluded me. I ran my fingers along the edges of the chip paint, following along the line of the newly painted smile. 
its very existence causing my hairs to stand on end. I wanted to rid myself of the painting as quickly as possible. I phoned the client and patiently waited for an answer that never came. I tried again a few minutes later, then an hour, then four. The man would not answer, and there was nothing prompting a voicemail. I quickly powered up my laptop and sent a reply to one of his emails, periodically checking for a response. The day swept by in a foggy haze, the confusions of the painting dissipating as my mind tended to my other works. Before long, I had forgotten the chip paint and the foreboding smirk that stood in its place. Even my attempts at contacting the buyer took its departure. That night, the strange sounds I'd heard the previous night once again made their presence. I tried, this time, to ignore them. Fearful of the mystifying anomalies I was sure to witness. Just as the night before, I was lulled to sleep by my growing suspicions. A sharp... Twinge like jagged knives jolted me from my dormancy. I surveyed my arm desperately trying to locate the source of the pain. The paralyzing realization hit me like a train tunneling into a stalled car. A patch of skin, the length of a six inch blade, was torn from my muscle. Blood bubbled on its surface, burning like acid through sheet metal. My ability to sleep through its removal baffled me. I searched my bed for the culprit, thinking it to be the doing of some parasitic monstrosity. It wasn't until I glanced at the painting that I discovered the horrifying culmination. A small patch of skin sat layered over the skeleton's bone. My skin. I staggered shrinkingly to the painting, carefully scraping at the patch. It wouldn't come off. It was as if I merged my own skin into the painting itself. It even felt smooth to the touch in comparison to the rough, callous surface of the canvas. I knew I had to get rid of this painting. I quickly remembered my fruitless attempts of contacting the buyer and decided to check my email again before calling him. His response muddled my brain like a cold sweat during springtime. My apologies, sir. I'm terribly sorry for the delayed response. As I stated before, I am a very busy man. I'm afraid I've already come to collect the painting. It is exactly what I wanted. Well worth the money. But there is still something I need from you before the purchase is complete. The meaning of his words flew over me like a pigskin through a field goal. I was never one to believe in the paranormal, but I couldn't shake the feeling that his words ran deeper than the Mariana Trent. I had to destroy that painting by any means possible. I snatched the painting from its resting place and carried it to the garage. Anchoring it against the wall, I hunted the area for a gas can and drenched the painting in gasoline. I watched the flames devour the painting, the canvas tearing with audible shrieks. With a closer inspection, I could have sworn I saw the skeleton move. I backed away in horror as the skeleton withdrew from the canvas, its bones blackened from the burning embers. I stared, wide eyes as it met my gaze. It slowly unhinged its crooked jaw, yelling out words that fueled me with terror-stricken adrenaline. Give me... Your skin! I sprang towards the door in a frenzied panic. As I reached for the knob, I felt his skeletal fingers wrap around my ankles, quickly pulling me down. 
I screamed in agony as he tore through the flesh of my shoulder with daggered claws. I watched in horror as it tried hopelessly to attach my shredded skin to its badly burned cartilage. Oh, I had to get rid of this thing. But how? I looked around the room and quickly spotted my old club hammer resting in a corner. Acting quickly while it was distracted, I headbutted the beast, which proved more painful than useful, and shoved it aside. It groaned as I leaped from the ground and rushed for the hammer. The creature stumbled after me as I gripped it tightly in my hands, bringing down hard onto the skull. It fractured underneath the excessive force, splintering like a tortoise's shell on impact. He howled in misery, sheltering what was left of him with his battered hands. I dropped the hammer to the ground, my trembling breaths ringing in echoes through the recrudescent silence. I gathered the bones, setting them ablaze once more to ensure its death. The hospital was able to patch up my shoulder as best they could. I decided to make up the lie that a rabid dog had attacked me. I never brought up the incident to anyone. As for the painting, <laughs> I never again painted a life-size piece after that. Who knows what kind of spirits would come to possess it. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. <laughs>